Thank you to all panelists for very interesting uh, in introductions. I will very short open up for uh, Q&A from, from the audience. Uh, already noticed three people wanting to come on very quickly. And the fourth, uh, I can, uh, and fifth. <laughs> and I will try to get everybody off you, but as, as I mentioned, I will uh, have to end within 9.15. Uh, so I think I will start with Halvor Sjön, uh, was the first one. And remember to be speak up and be brief. Please stand up. Thank you very much. I'm an uh, independent journalist. Um, no one of you mentioned the word uh, nationhood. Uh, and uh, of course, China is a nation and China is not a democracy. But what we see in Iraq today, I think, is a very interesting example that you cannot build a democracy without having a feeling of being together, belonging to a nation. And the problem with Iraq was not the, the, that the West tried to introduce a democracy. The, the problem was that they didn't have a feeling of belonging together in a nation. And we see that today. So isn't a nation building just as important as democracy building? OK, the question is about nation building. If I start with you, Larry Diamond, what role does nation building play in, in the role of democracy? Well. <clears throat> First thing I want to say is I was opposed to the intervention in Iraq, and even though I went there afterwards to try and um, uh, help write the interim constitution and foster democratic development, uh, I think that it was one of the most disastrous things the American uh, government has done in the post-World War II period. And I agree with the uh, comment you made uh, that um, we can't promote democracy ever at the point of a bayonet or a tank, or A, it won't work, and B, it will discredit the process of democracy promotion, which is part of the trouble that we're in. And if many of you are wondering why this inflection point uh, in terms of the uh, stagnation or decline of democracy happened around 2005, you might bear in mind what happened in uh, March of 2003 in terms of the American invasion of Iraq. Uh, I agree with your point. Uh, it's the fundamental point of Dankwart Rousteau's seminal essay, Transitions to Democracy, that the one actual precondition for successful democratization is some sense of what constitutes the nation, some, uh, some agreement on that. But if you look at the work of uh, Juan Lentz and Alfred Stapon uh, on the formation of what they call state nations, like India, which have a kind of multinational sense of statehood. I think you can start with a partial sense of this uh, and then gradually, as the Indians have done, build up a more robust sense of what constitutes the nation state. What you can't start with is no sense of this and uh, complete fragmentation and expect to build democracy on that. And you see the disintegrating impact of it in Iraq today. It's really a tragedy. Yeah, I do agree on that, and I can say much about the invasion of Iraq. It was a great mistake by US and UK, and we remember it. We stood up against that uh, invasion. Uh, and I think we have uh, seen, experienced today some of the consequences of that invasion too. But uh, I also will um, uh, mention another <coughs> dimension of building a nation, a nationhood. And that is ethnicity. Because from countries where the Oslo Center have projects today, I think of Kenya, South Sudan, Somalia, ethnic conflicts uh, are crucial and a special challenge which we are not used to from our democracy in Norway. So the best challenge is how, how to build commonalities between the ethnic class in such countries like that. How to build a, a nation. Uh, and of course, the answer is to bring them together, to find commonalities and so on, but very often also the political solution has to be a sort of federalism, because they demand some uh, self-determination in, in areas where they uh, have the majority and where they in fact are ruling. So federalism is a key word, very often the only solution. For unexceptional state. You have the same in Myanmar, Burma. 
where the ethnic di you, you cannot understand Myanmar if you don't understand the ethnic dimension in that country. So that is a very uh, important challenge in many countries with regard to nation building. Uh, you mentioned uh, identity uh, and nation building with many different identities. That could be a problem, couldn't it? Clearly, I, I, mean, I think Hyun's uh, question is, is very key. I mean, mm -hmm. modern democracy is very much linked, of course, to, uh, to a nation, a, a political entity, and the state system. But I think what is still very interesting when you visit beyond Europe, which we know culturally, you find that in, in, um, in the civil society fabric, which I believe is, is very important to focus on, as I mentioned in my intervention, you find very strong democratic tradition and instincts which are not necessarily what we recognize in our modern European state building mechanisms of having elections every fourth year or you know, electing our, our candidates at schools and at the workplace and so on. But it's a question about is there a culture in the civil society that you come to, uh, that you solve issues by, by negotiation, by, 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 by dialogue, by compromise, <coughs> accepting uh, the, the final decision. Now, Still, uh, two, three hundred years after the creation of the modern European nation state, we hold on to that notion as the key of organizing uh, uh, political systems. And, and that is a bit absurd because we have to compare Norway with China or Luxembourg with China. Uh, so I think um, uh, uh, we have to go a bit deeper than that and, and that our European lens on understanding and, and analyzing uh, democratic functioning has some limitations because, you know, there's, there are very weak comparisons in, in the way states are run, nations are run. I already have too many signed on speakers that I will try to, to, to get to as many as you as uh, possi possible. First, Gilham, I have this. Thank you. Uh, um, my name is Anna Gilham. I'm, I'm a political scientist at Civita and president of the European Movement. Uh, we had a very interesting um, seminar yesterday with the former Minister of Defence, Paul Correa, from Germany, and Janusz Oniewski from uh, Poland. And Oniewski said that the main reason for the problems of Turkey and Russia is that the political system, political culture, is not based on rationality and reason, but on faith. What do you think about that? Well, on faith, the believing in some kind of, a, as he said about uh, Russia, some kind of true Christianity. And Putin is the, um, the, the messiah of this true Christianity. And, and Janusz said, that, that there were more checks and balances in the Soviet system than there is today in Russia. So, of course, Russia is, is a challenge, and the question is about Putin and, and, and the, the role of faith. Um, well, I'll start with you, Bonnet. Well, well, I don't know what's about faith. <laughs> As a believer, <laughs> I'm in doubt. Not only I'm, uh, since I'm a believer, but... Uh, well, oh, it, uh, to be serious, it is, of course, very, dif uh, very important to differ between religion and politics. But I can see that as the main problem in, in Russia and Turkey of today. Of course, I, it's interesting because I talked several times with pri uh, now President, former Prime Minister Erdogan in Turkey. He was very interested in the relations between religion and politics. And, and he was interested in my approach as a Christian Democrat. And he had the vision of developing his party to be a Muslim democratic country. Not to mix faith and uh, politics but to see the ethical links between them. And they are obvious. Uh, and um, so I'm surprised how he has uh, developed and how he's behaving today. But I don't think his main problem is that uh, the faith is taking over for politics in his uh, situation. I, I think uh, it's, it's simply a question of, of power. He likes power. And he has been used to power too long time. And uh, I do believe the same with Putin in Russia. Well, sometimes we say that Putin has two main pillars for his uh, policy. That's Orthodox Church and it's petroleum. What is most important, I don't know. Uh, but uh, but uh, maybe that are the two main pillars. But I don't think the faith has taken over for Putin in a, a, in a wrong way. I, I think it's more a question of... Uh, keeping power. You understand that? Well, I think this alludes to the point I tried to make in my intervention that, you know, when you are not delivering on the real issues of people, when you are set to govern, uh, in semi-authoritarian regimes, you pull out other identities and threat factors to stick, hang, stick on to power. And to me, that is the analysis of Russia. 
they are failing their modernization. I mean, at least under Medvedev, there was a modernistic agenda. You know, they wanted to attract research and investment, and, and when he was here on the state visit in 2010, the discussions he had intensively with us was how we organize our research council, how can we get modern people to come in. Now, when Putin came back to power, I think he found out, you know, this is for some reason not working, and he has to turn to these kind of pseudo uh, identity issues, which is creating threat. And I mentioned this at other discussions. I don't see him necessarily as being an aggressive expansionist, but an aggressive isolationist, which is, you know, struggling to hold together his own. And, and there are long stories about uh, how the Tsars have done that uh, to, to, to keep power in Russia. They, they fear more things coming from underneath in their own society than really the threat from outside. Professor Diamond, you, you mentioned uh, Turkey in, in your speech, and it was kind of depressing to seeing it has developed in the, in the, in the wrong uh, direction. And I mean, Turkey has also been said that it should be a model for the rest of the Middle East in terms of democracy. It can have really devastating consequences for democratic promotion if Turkey goes the direction you says, couldn't it? Uh, it could, but I think the model in Turkey has mutated in a way uh, that Prime Minister Vondovic uh, perfectly captured in his remarks. Uh, and I think that when Abdullah Gul was a moderating factor uh, in the AKP, things were better, just as when Medvedev was president during that brief four-year period, things were better. I, I think, I strongly associate with everything that these two uh, uh, distinguished gentlemen have just said, but just with one caveat that I'll add in a minute. And I think the implications of this are, first of all, to remind ourselves, because you see this always with the cynical mobilization of ethnicity in Sub-Saharan Africa as well, that the mobilization of identity, nationalism, religion, ethnic, communal identity, it's the last refuge of scoundrels who don't have programs and good governance to offer their people in the competition for power. That's the first point. And the second point is this is why we need term limits. Somebody may start out as a relatively decent figure, uh, and they go bad as they get drunk with power and uh, insecure in the face of it. Uh, the Putin of today is not the Putin who assumed power uh, in 1999-2000. And Erdogan, I think, has mutated in uh, really worrisome ways. Now, was he always like that and just waiting for this opportunity? There's no way to know. Uh, but one of the things that we really need to fight is the um, uh, expanding effort of uh, elected leaders to eliminate term limits so they can stay there forever. The one caveat uh, I would add, uh, with a slight tweak of what you just said, is I think it's not aggressive expansionism that is at work in Russia today, but opportunistic expansionism. I don't think Vladimir Putin has a strategy to swallow up Ukraine uh, that he was waiting to unfold until the right moment or any place else, but he will respond to opportunities and he will exploit weakness, which is why I think refurbishing NATO is frankly an urgent priority right now. Uh, and standing up to his opportunism, I think, is an urgent priority right now. And the other tweak is that he, because his system has failed so badly, and because there's a limit to how far he can ride the Russian Orthodox religion itself to the uh, perpetuation and consolidation of his power, he needs the stoking of the fires of aggrieved Russian nationalism to continue to support his political base. And unfortunately, I think this is going to require uh, continued military adventurism in order to do that. And that's a very sobering implication I take out of his invasion of Ukraine. Uh, there was many hands uh, in the beginning. There was somebody in, in there, I think. Yes, you. Please stand up, speak up. Um, as a... Um uh, as an American, I, I look at the EU as an experiment in democratization of, of Europe. And uh, if this was 100 years ago, we might have a war over it at this point. So that's an interesting. So my, my question is, going forward with the, and looking at, uh, as an example of the, the Middle East, for example, and saying Iraq 10 years ago, the invasion was a mistake. Now we're at least seeing the results uh, or an ongoing policy of an opposite sort of point of view of letting the the uh, 
uh, events sort of sweep the Middle East, which may take a generation or two to see the results of that. So given that the, the 10 years ago the invasion didn't work, there seems to be uh, a lot of conflict that what's going on now isn't the right course of action as well. What does the democracies of the world do in this instance and going forward from a global perspective in dealing with these issues um, to, to sort of to, to, to help uh, democracies sort of take hold in areas, uh, specifically the Middle East, uh, when you have a situation that's going going now. So the question is about the Middle East. That could, of course, be a, another breakfast meeting and a, and a long, long discussion. But it is an interesting part that most people agree that the Iraq, Iraq invasion was, uh, fa was, a, was a failed mission. But now nobody's doing anything in Syria. And that is also <laughs> some round of uh, criticism. So you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. Uh, what are your thoughts, uh, Bonavik? Is, is Syria an example to follow for the world community? Well, there are many failed nations, and uh, I, I don't think that we can start and argue for invasion in countries that are failing. Uh, first of all, it's important that, especially for a small country like Norway, that we are behaving in full accordance with international law and order. And of course, that was a problem with regard to Iraq. In my view, it was in contradiction to international law, what they did. They had no mandate from the UN. Uh, they were not asked upon by the Iraqi authorities to come, as they were now, with regard to IS. That's very different. Because then it is in full accordance with international law. Uh, so to keep up international law and order is in itself very important in order to promote democracy. Uh, secondly, I will say that uh, I think in the longer perspective, regime change is not uh, a sufficient argument to invade a country. There are many regimes we should want to change, uh, but that's not an argument in itself to invade. But is there an argument to, to do something in Syria? To do something more military, maybe? Or? If we could, of course, I, I know that it's a problem, because, especially because of Russia and China, to get the consensus in the UN. With regard to fight IS in Iraq, the international community has been asked by Iraq to act, and we do. With regard to Syria, we don't have the same uh, request from the Syrian authorities, and that is, of course, a challenge. Uh, I, uh, it's a dilemma, of course, but uh, I'm not sure that an invasion in contradiction to international law in Syria will help the situation. Because who are we going to fight for? We know that the opposition in Syria is so fragmented, and there are different groups who will take over in Syria. You, you don't know. So the situation is so complex that I don't think that is a solution. I, I, to, to be honest, I don't see for the time being a clear solution on the Syrian problem. But I don't see an invasion as a solution either. Can Stöhle, any thoughts on the Middle East mm. democracy? Well, um, big, big complex. I think well, one thing we do learn is if we, if we study the forces that are exposed in these conflicts, we see deep roots. Mm. So, you know, you may be tempted to say, well, this is something which uh, has a long, uh, a, a big anchor, Shia, Sunni, uh, Arab, um, uh, and does it does it need to have to be fought out in, in some sense? I think that uh, our participation in, in the current training mission in Iraq is in itself highly complex, because it is not, as uh, it was mentioned, Iraq is not one nation asking for help. There are four military forces fighting each other on that terrain, and we are now uh, seeming to end up supporting two of them uh, in some kind of contradiction. So I think uh, clearly, uh, Invasion is no answer. Who should invade? And uh, I would certainly not be <laughs> pressing the button for yes, sending uh, <coughs> troops to invade uh, with the. Uh, but on that notion, what about Libya? I mean, Norway was part of uh, getting rid of Gaddafi. <coughs> it wasn't turned out to be a. Good question. I, I would say, you know, here you have a generation of decision makers in Europe who have been deeply marked by two recent events in Europe Srebrenica and in Africa, uh, the massacre uh, of, uh, in, in Rwanda. And here was another 
probable scenario of another slaughter of civilians. And you have an international mandate to intervene by all necessary means. Okay, one could say this is a bluff. We don't. And I, for one, uh, was clearly you know, critical to what uh, military might from above could do to really settle issues on the ground. And it ended as it did, and I think it's clear that from the international community there was a complete abandonment of responsibility after that uh, intervention. Uh, what that could have been in instead is, is difficult to say because the, it, it is very complex, but I think it simply proves that you know, fixing very deeply rooted issues on the ground from high altitude uh, is a tricky issue. Larry Diamond, what would you say are the learnings from the past 10 years well, in the Arab um, world? Uh, I want to address two points. Sure. Uh, one, the point that was just made about Libya, and then come back to the question about what positively we can do in terms of democracy promotion in the Middle East. So I, I was strongly against the American military intervention in Iraq. I don't disagree with anything that either of you said. I really felt Libya was different. The people had risen up. Uh, there was a revolution underway. and There was absolutely no doubt, let's not rewrite history, that they were going to be brutally slaughtered in Benghazi unless we acted. And let me tell you, the President of the United States, States waited till the last possible moment to launch NATO airstrikes. If he had made it 20, waited 24 more hours, it might have been too late. The intervention was successful. The combination of air power and the revolutionary military action of Lib Libyans risking their lives, many of them with no military background, doctors, lawyers, engineers going back to the country to fight in a very idealistic uh, way for their country, toppled one of the most ruthless <coughs> dictators and one of the most unpredictable ones in the Middle East. And then, you are absolutely right, we walked away. We just walked away from Libya. There was a specific request from the Libyan transitional government to the President of the United States asking for military and security assistance. And from what I know, they got virtually nothing. And I think that is a very um, short-sighted and uh, disgraceful uh, lapse in our judgment and historical responsibility. Now, to the question that was posed, Look, the challenge now is not mainly a military challenge. It is in Iraq. It is in a limited way with respect to ISIS. But in most of the Middle East, uh, you don't have warfare. What you have is resurgent authoritarianism. Uh, and I think uh, the imperatives are to return to the bread and butter of diplomacy and political assistance to defend and advance democratic constitutionalism, as you said, civil society and human rights, and every country needs a different strategy. In Tunisia, they need enormous amounts of economic, transitional economic assistance, <clears throat> state assistance to reform their state institutions, uh, and build up the judiciary, the party system, and so on and so forth, and strengthen civil society. In Egypt, we need enormous collective pressure on a semi-fascistic government that is about to put to death over 100 innocent people, and they've already executed many of them, on totally spurious charges, uh, thinking, well, we'll just go along because we need them in the war on terror. Uh, and so we need to kind of buck up our resolve here and make it clear to the military government, let's not forget what it really is in Cairo, uh, that there will be enormous, we're, it's not gonna be business as usual, and he can kill 100 more people, and then we'll just ignore what he's done. There are going to be lasting consequences to his position in the world uh, if he goes ahead with this, and that someday he may be dragged before The Hague and held accountable for what he's done. 30 seconds, Gustav. Yes, go just on. On, on that last example, um, three years ago, when, when Egypt was in this balance, uh, we very modestly organized a trip from Cairo to Oslo with a group of um, Egyptian politicians and, and political activists, ranging from the Muslim Brotherhood through uh, traditional non uh, secular parties, um, a group of 10, 15 people. They spent a week in Oslo and they visited institutions, parliament, government, the press, um, the ombudsman's office, and so on. And they all end up, ended up in my office as foreign minister. And they said, you know, they have learned more about each other on that trip than they ever had back in Cairo. And they found out that you know, you know, we may differ, but we don't kill each other uh, at first sight.
<laughs> now the guy from the Muslim Brotherhood has a death sentence. He is in prison. And one of the charges brought against him is his visit to Oslo on that trip. Which I think, you know, is just absolutely appalling. And it makes me really sick to think about that he is sitting there, perhaps waiting for that peloton, with these charges hanging on his, on his head. We will take two more interventions from, from the audience. First, uh, Stig Arvel, and then also not just the lady. Uh, then we will end. Stig Arvel first. Uh, Professor Diamond, you mentioned corruption, which I'm very happy to mention. It's important in the climate of democracy. Um, I have another question about <coughs> economics. So you mentioned progress, and I understand that as meaning not exclusively possibly, but economic growth, uh, first and foremost. <coughs> and um, GDP is uh, the number that's being held up most when we try to ask the question whether a, a country or a government is successful. Do they provide growth? economic growth for its people. Uh, to what extent do you think that our obsession with this absolutely absurd number, which says very little about human progress, about human development, um, creates problems for the expansion of democracy? So the question about the role of GDP in, in the, in the, in the, in the democracy uh, discussion, uh, I can start with you, Larry Diamond. Uh, what, what role do you see uh, when we use GDP? Is it, is, it, is it a good measure to measure economic growth and the quality of well, it's democracy? A, it's obviously uh, a, a very troubled measure, uh, and you know that or you wouldn't have asked the question. Um, and it's tro troubling in part because, you know, in some places it's not that, in lower income countries, not that easy to measure it, uh, and there's a lot of measurement error, but also it tells us nothing about the distribution of wealth. Uh, look at the, uh, uh, you know, per capita income of um, Equatorial Guinea, uh, which looks like a, you know, middle income or higher country, and look at how the people of that miserable slice of earth are living, uh, and you realize that, you know, most of the oil wealth is, is being absconded with, so it can become ridiculous. I mean, this is why we have the Human Development Index, because it's a much better measure of real experienced and lived uh, development progress. Uh, and so I, I usually kind of favor that in trying to understand what kind of human development progress is being made. Well, let me, yeah, this is a, a very interesting question, and it's a, an increasing international debate, how we should measure the welfare state. And, and uh, last week, uh, or two weeks ago, on the Partnership for Change conference here in Oslo, it was a, a speech by Professor Michael Green, who has developed what he calls a social index. Mm -hmm. Not to replace GDP, because GDP has its value, but it's limited. It's, not, it's saying something, but not everything, about the welfare state. So to try to develop a social index in addition to GDP to supplement each other. We say more about the quality of a society. Well, that goes on, that has to do with, of course, uh, criteria as health and education, democracy, uh, respect for human rights, and other important issues that has to do with our welfare. So, and, and I know that there will be a debate in the Norwegian Parliament about this as well, because there is a um, proposal coming up from some parties that will initiate, initiate a debate about this. It's, it's really timely to have this debate. Yeah, that's the just very shortly, on purpose I did not mention GDP. I, I talked about progress and of course being able to continue uh, distributive uh, policies, uh, balancing uh, uh, a well-functioning society is different if you are in, in a progress or in decline. Now I believe democracy is very good when you meet tough times and you have, to, I mean we basically in this country have been di discussing how to distribute growth. How do you handle distribution of decline? And there you, you would say ideally democracy would be the best because you could balance again and distribute the burdens and, and get acceptance for how you meet, deal with those tough times. Now fortunately we have not had to experience that that much but it will be interesting to see the quality of democracy throughout Europe as they have to face 50% youth unemployment and other mass reductions of characteristics of their welfare states. Will they be the same democracies on the other side? I question that. Last question from the audience. Please just come up and speak up. Uh, 
Uh, what I'd like to ask is how do you preach democracy to a country like Uganda, which has had um, your wedding seven, uh, your wedding seven for like half a day, almost quarter century, and is going to do for another five years. And the example of that's the example of democracy. And before that was Idi Amin, so that's the only thing that they know. So how do you preach democracy to such a country in Africa? So the question is, how do you preach democracy to uh, Uganda? I think we can test that question and, and also take your final remarks. I can start with you. Bonavik, um, any good advice to Uganda? <laughs> well, I'm not an expert on Uganda. We are not working in that kind of African country. But we see the same in Uganda as in several other African countries. And some leaders believe that they are the only who can rule that country. And they stay in office and change the constitution in order to, uh, to continue. So it is a question about uh, a democratic culture. I uh, want once again to emphasize that. It's not only about democratic institutions and legislation and so on. It's a question about power sharing. Power sharing is a key word for democracy. Uh, so that culture has to develop in, in Uganda as well. Egypt is a very interesting case. I had a delegation from the Muslim Brotherhood in my office yesterday. And, and some of them have been in prison for several years. It was a very interesting case because as we know, uh, President Morsi from Muslim Brotherhood, he was democratically elected in Egypt, no doubt. But so he started to behave and develop the country in a way that many were really uh, ang uh, ang uh, feared that he would develop an Islamic state, an undemocratic state. And so the real Democrats of Egypt made an alliance with the military and the made a coup against the democratically elected. Government. What should we say about that? I don't have a clear answer. Uh, it has up to, it's up to the Egyptians. But how they are now behaving with all these death penalties, imprisoning of political opponents, I don't think there is a solution uh, of the threat of an Islamic state to imprison uh, people like members of Muslim Brotherhood. So, once again, this has to do with uh, developing a democratic way of thinking, a democratic culture. You don't make a sustainable democracy by force and by imprisoning your opponents. That should be my last word. Just a final remark. Well, on Uganda, uh, my last encounter with uh, the president in Uganda was a one hour discussion about the death penalty for homosexuals. And that was a bill proposed in Parliament, and it would be adopted perfectly democratically by elected representatives. So it would be a legitimate decision. Now, at the same time, I would say, you know, uh, having met with, you know, people from your country, I, I presume, there is a deep democratic culture in part of the cultural um, civil society of, of your country. So I think one element that Professor Diamond turned to, which is very complex but still possible, is to continue to support in the right way uh, the channels of communication and openness to these undercurrents. And one day that may be what builds momentum for uh, democratic change. Larry Diamond, your final remark? First of all, uh, let me pick up on where you left off with respect to Uganda specifically. <clears throat> and um, its political culture. You know, if you look at the data, as I do very closely and uh, repeatedly, of the African, uh, the Afrobarometer, the repeated public opinion survey, which I think possibly uh, Norwegian Aid is supported, and if it has, I thank you for doing so, because it's an extremely important instrument for understanding democratic development in Africa. Uh, you see a general, and frankly to me as a social scientist and trained as a modernization theorist to think that there's a strong relationship between economic development, prosperity and education on the one hand and the growth of democratic values on the, on the other. So if you start with that theoretical presumption, the results in one respect are shocking. Not that they contradict uh, that people will gravitate more to democratic values as they become more uh, educated and uh, embedded in a market economy and so on. Although very few people are taking note of it, I think that's happening in China. But that doesn't mean that poor people with very limited education, who might even still be illiterate, can't by 
means of experience and by means of other forms of social communication and civic experience in a kind of Tocquevillian fashion, come to a deep and sincere uh, uh, conviction uh, about the value of democracy, rule of law, and human rights. And the Afrobarometer data show, in general, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and specifically in Uganda, um, that this has happened, that there's a, a strong aspiration for political accountability, for limited government, for rule of law, for le uh, a legislature that can constrain, constrain the executive, uh, for independent judiciary, not just a kind of infatuation with the word democracy and nobody understanding what it means. And I think Uganda is an excellent uh, country with which to conclude uh, and discuss this problem uh, for two reasons. Number one, the problem is not the people of Africa. It really isn't. Uh, and it isn't the culture, and it isn't even the, quote, primordial, end quote. I hate the, when that word is used. Ethnic divisions, which we know are manipulated for politi cynical political advantage in the way we were discussing earlier. The problem is the elites who barricade themselves in power, gorge themselves on the wealth of the country, and don't want to leave. And you've got the typical African party of problem now with Museveni, who's been there for over three decades and is now grooming his son to succeed him. Uh, and it is, um, it's shameful. It's shameful that it's been allowed to happen. And it's shameful that Western aid agencies keep pouring uh, money uh, into the general accounts of the state budget with no accountability or uh, demand for um, uh, for really free and fair elections, which are grotes grotesquely rigged uh, in Uganda. Uh, and the country will not move forward, and I think the Ugandan people know it, uh, without democracy. My second point, I've got two more points. One is, um, uh, Museveni knows what he's doing. You think he cares about whether people are gay or not, and who they sleep with, and who they love? He's latched onto this. For, for the same reason that Putin has latched on to uh, ethnocentric Russian identity and now his infatuation with mo the most conservative and uh, atavistic uh, elements of the Russian Orthodox Church. It serves his purposes politically to create um, some outgroup that can focus the wrath, the frustration, um, the angst of a, uh, of a population that's unhappy. Uh, and whenever you're in trouble politically, the last refuge of a political scoundrel is to pick on some uh, marginal minority uh, and try and steer all of the public's uh, anger and frustration toward them. Uh, finally, um, I do want to say, uh, in response to Prime Minister Bondovic, that it is true. I think it's unambiguously true uh, that Morsi was abusing power, number one, and moving very rapidly toward the construction of um, an authoritarian, at least Islamist influence state, in which the Muslim Brotherhood was going to become a, a hegemonic power. Uh, I personally think that that was rapidly happening. It was partly a response to what he saw as the insecurity of the situation, and partly a response to the fact that I think he isn't and wasn't a Democrat. And that start, stands in stark contrast to the um, Islamist political leader of Anakta in Tunisia, Rashid Ganoushi, who made a series of just dramatically different political choices that helped, that helped to understand why Tunisia moved in a very different direction. Uh, but the two points I wanted to make is none of that justifies a death sentence against Morsi or any other of these individuals, number one. And number two, none of that uh, justifies a conclusion that the uh, secular Egyptian kind of political activists and party leaders who then uh, came out onto the streets, called for the military to intervene, and blessed the military coup of July 2013, that they themselves were Democrats. They were liberals. But they're not Democrats. And that, frankly, there are precious few Democrats in Egypt. Uh, because uh, the liberal, middle class, secular people, many of them my friends, 
um, are uh, fearful of the populist majority, uh, as intolerant of the Muslim Brotherhood as the Muslim Brotherhood was of them, and all too willing to bless and ignore the authoritarian excesses of the current government. There are a few dedicated liberals who are deeply committed to democracy, who are in civil society and academia and so on, and it's very important to understand that many of them are in jail now as well, or banned from leaving the country, like my friend who's supposed to be a visiting scholar at Stanford right now, Professor Amr Hamzawi of uh, uh, the American University of Cairo. Uh, and they're in very, very grave danger now. And these are not Islamists. They are, are liberal. They're, they're, they're people who identify with our values in almost every respect. Before we give a warm round of applause, let me use 20 seconds to say three things. My apology to the people who didn't come on to the speaker's list due to time. Our next breakfast meeting should be interesting for many here. It's about Putin's Russia and how Europe should meet that challenge with Minister of Defense, the United States and European uh, politicians. And do follow the Osmond Freedom Forum on osmondfreedomforum.com. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you. To the